What's up, everybody? NHL a DFS Diary Time. It's your buddy Chopadong. I am coming at you with the quickest slate breakdown you're going to find today. We're going to turbo through this. We've got a lot of new guys joining us from the NBA side of things that are probably scratching itches right and left as they head to their all-star break, wanting to get caught up on hockey really, really quickly. So that's the goal of today. Of course, our coaches inside DFSArmy.com are going to dive deeper than I am, but I'm going to essentially walk you through the slate, talk a little bit of fundamentals, and then show you a little bit of how to search for some value and stuff using our research tool, and then turn you loose. Uh, correlation is huge in NHL, as you probably already know. Usually a goal is, is accompanied by an assist or two, and you're going to want both of those in tournaments to tightly correlate those, uh, those points so that you're very, very efficient in your scoring and catapulting yourself up the leaderboards when a significant event like a goal being scored happens. Now, in cash games, you're going to want to spread out a little bit more so that you kind of soften the blow of being all in on a particular line. You'd rather maybe take a piece of the top line and a piece of the second line. Maybe they overlap on a power play or something. That way, you assure yourself a greater chance at catching a piece of the goal if one gets scored. But in tournaments, you're going to want to go all in. And you're going to want to try and capture every single piece of every single goal you possibly can. Now, where would we target on a day like today? We would be looking at, uh, you know, something along the lines of some people like the season-long stats as a baseline. And then I'm going to be looking at the last 10 games as a little bit of a barometer. Are they playing better than they have been so far this season? Or are they playing worse than they have been so far this season? And so, just like I do with my buyers and sellers type stuff, if you've seen any of that, I'm looking at a big baseline and a shorter baseline, and I'm trying to determine who I should be keying in on and who I should not be. And I'm going to look at goals for and I'm going to look at goals against when I'm looking at that particular category. All your Vegas stuff up here, is, you know, odds are good for maybe picking on goalies and whatnot, trying to figure that out as far as who has the best shot at getting the win in a game. The over-under will tell you generally is it supposed to be a higher scoring game or a lower scoring game. Five and a half is low, six is average, six and a half is high. That's really about all the range you see. Occasionally you see a seven. Uh, we used to see some fives back in the day, but generally speaking, six is where you're going to stand a little above or a little bit below. So it's not a real accurate predictor of what's going to happen. It's more of a Vegas macro look at the scoring potential of a game, if you will. Um, looking over here, I see that we've, what, we're scoring a little bit under our average at 2.0 versus 2.8. So I'm not going to be paying a lot of attention to the Islanders. I look here, they're they are coming up a little bit. They were at 1.1, 1.2 a little while ago. Their last 10 games are coming back up more towards their average, but they're still not allowing very many goals against. So that's a bad sign for Columbus. However, Columbus has been scoring fairly well at home, more so than usual. I don't know that they're really allowing enough goals for me to want to target this type of an offense, but there is a sneakier side of Columbus tonight if you want to think that maybe New York is their defense, their elite, elite defense the past, say, I don't know, 20, 30 games, is starting to cool off and relax a little bit. There's a little bit of a tournament narrative that you could play there and bank on that kind of a trend. Calgary is a better offense to target. 3.6 on the season, 3.9 in the last 10 games. So trending up still, even though they are coming back out of the fours, they were in the fours for a while. They're giving up goals at about 3.5 per game over the last 10. And Florida is not really scoring a ton, so it's kind of a mediocre matchup. It's not some green light situation where you're going to be all in. And they're not really giving up a ton of goals either, so it's not really some all-in type of play for Calgary either. Just realize Calgary is a powerful offense. Calgary is rather, uh, rather popular inside the NHL game. And one thing you can really do is you can exploit popularity in NHL like almost no other sport. Um, golf is one you hear fade the chalk. MLB is one you hear fade the chalk. Because these sports are volatile enough, the range of outcomes in a player is so great from 0 to 45 points for a skater. Um, and, and even in some cases 55 and 60 points on truly phenomenal nights. But any skater can get you a 0 from a $9,000 guy to a $3,000 guy. It doesn't matter. Anyone can get you a zero on any given night. So with that kind of an outcome, that kind of a range of outcomes, very, very volatile sport, the chalk fails a lot. And because the chalk fails a lot, you gain more at leverage than normal when you fade the chalk and stack almost against it for a double dip or stack somewhere else in a little bit lesser chalky, a little bit less popular area. 
Calgary is fairly popular night in and night out. They're also very expensive, and that's why I'm going into detail here is to tell you they're perfectly fine to, to roster on your teams because they are a good scoring offense. Um, you might look at this and go, man, I don't know. I don't feel quite as safe rostering them in this particular matchup, but they are also a very good fade in tournaments and whatnot because you're going to play both sides of this kind of mediocre matchup, in my opinion, mediocre matchup, just based on the recent numbers. Ottawa has been giving up goals against, but not so much lately. Look at them on the year, giving up a ton of goals. They look like they've kind of righted the ship, maybe not at home, on their road splits, but a little bit right of the ship over the last 10 games. They're not scoring a ton themselves. I want to see a green number here, something stronger over three than this right on the nose, you know, three right on the nose. Looking over at Detroit, not nothing really to, to, to look at. Not a lot of offense, not a lot. Of, so you're, you're looking at these types of situations and saying maybe some one-offs and stuff, but I'm not necessarily wanting to gamble on a full line stack. Okay, that's kind of the idea. Now you might stack against uh, Ottawa, hoping they revert to form. But again, it's not an indicator that that's happening lately, except maybe on the road. Maybe a little bit more of a GPP type of narrative, uh, a little bit more uh, than a neutral. Excuse me, a little bit more than a neutral GPP. A little more on the positive side, but still kind of a GPP narrative in this scenario. We'll find some. It's a big enough slate. We'll find some on this slate that we and we may have to revert back to something like this because it's the most positive that we see. Again, you need to be taking the slate as a macro view. Some slates are stronger than others. Some have very very strong positive indicators. Some don't. Some have media. And some slates are small and you don't have a lot of choices, and so you have to take lesser players than you usually would. Some are bigger, and you can stick with the more elite matchups. That's just kind of the way DFS flows, night in and night out. And hockey's no different than any other sport. Um, Dallas not good offensively right now. Tyler Sagan is, and we may see that in some numbers. But and defensively, they're not giving up a lot of goals. And that puts a little bit of pressure on Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay last week or so matched up against St. Louis. And St. Louis has played very well defensively over the last, say, 20 games or more. And Tampa struggled against them. So a good defensive team can shut Tampa down. And if you look at Tampa, four goals on, on the season and not in the last 10 games, Tampa is struggling a little bit defensively or offensively. They may get it back, but they're struggling a little bit. They're not exactly a horrible defensive team either, although they're not exactly great. So with a non-scoring team and an elite defense going against what looks like a struggling offensive team who's not really given goals against, it's, it's kind of a nothing game. The six might be a little high. It should probably be a five and a half. Colorado, really bad lately. Giving up tons of goals. That puts Winnipeg in the driver's seat. Okay, Not scoring, they are giving up goals. That puts Hellebuck in a spot to get the win, hence the 164 uh, odds. The six and a five, six and a half might be a little bit, a little bit overzealous on Vegas's part. Winnipeg is scoring. They've got a great offense. They're not giving up a ton of goals against. They have been a little bit recently, but Colorado's been trash. So here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing very, very good indicator here that Winnipeg is the play. Big Vegas odds, decent total, decent implied team total, decent offense, especially last 10 games at home, horrible defense, last 10 games especially on the road in Colorado. Not scoring is Colorado, not giving up a ton of goals is Winnipeg, so I'm going to tell you two things here. The chalk move is to load up on Winnipeg. The contrarian move is to realize it's a fluky freaking sport and instead stack Colorado. I'm telling you, in a large field GPP, Colorado is a viable stack because not many people are on them anymore. Their top line is still lethal. If they could get their shit together for one game, it would surprise, it would surprise the DFS community. And by surprising the DFS community, if you happen to have them in one of your 10 lineups or whatever, and they go off, it can win you a pile of cash. Montreal Canadiens... Eh, they're okay offensively, scoring more than they had been recently, not giving up the goals they had been recently, so that's a good sign for them. Nashville's a little bit more of a defensive-oriented team, and outside of the back-to-back -back last Sunday they played against St. Louis, uh, not really a juggernaut in, in terms of offensive scoring. So we're looking at right around or just under three goals per game, which is under their season numbers, and they're not giving up a ton of goals. So, you know, again, just kind of an iffy, type of game. Not a great matchup for either team. New Jersey's been a train wreck, as you can see by the red. Goals against. That puts Chicago in a great spot. 
New Jersey's not exactly scoring a ton right now. And you go you come over this way. And now Chicago's been balls on fire offensively. They have been given goals against. So it's not like New Jersey's going to score nothing. But when you see an offense like this that's bright green going against a defense that's bright red, big sign that Chicago's in a great matchup tonight. And also, believe it or not, puts Cam Ward in a pretty good spot to get the win, hence the minus 162. Minus 150 and better is great. Uh, minus 200 is really strong, much like baseball. The 6.5, again, might be a little bit overzealous unless Chicago comes out of the gate and puts in 4 or 5 themselves. New Jersey might get a couple, but really and truly, New Jersey doesn't have much of a shot to win this game. So you're pretty safe to load up on a lot of Chicago players. So Winnipeg and Chicago might be our favorite offenses on the night. St. Louis has been playing really, really well. They've had a scoring outburst the past couple of games. Obviously, this 3.7 reflects the eight goals they put on New Jersey just the other night. And they're not giving up a ton of goals against. They're playing very, very well defensively. So what you're going to be looking at, in my opinion, is why they're the road favorite. Going into Arizona, though, historically, Arizona is a tough place to play. Two years on the road versus opponent going into Arizona, no offense, and giving up a couple of goals versus a little bit of offense, and then, of course, not giving up a couple of goals. I, I'm looking at this over the last two years, two goals against, or two goals for, three goals against, and I'm looking at this saying, this isn't the matchup that it looks like, and I'm waiting. St. Louis has won seven in a row. I'm waiting for St. Louis to lose a game. Until then, in cash games, they're still safe. I'm still riding the train. In GPPs, I can fade them. I don't know that I would stack Arizona. I'd probably have an Arizona skater or two, you know, your Richard Panics. Um, Hinnestrozas, Osterlees, Connor Garland's, uh, Stepans, Clayton Keller, those types. If they're in the lineup, they're worth looking at because they're generally pretty cheap and they can get you a little bit of value so that you can afford a bigger stack somewhere else. And this is the type of scenario that we're heading in. St. Louis themselves is heading into a, a couple of scenarios where they're going to go to Colorado Saturday and then they're going to come right out of Colorado and go to Minnesota on Sunday. There's a, three games and four nights that they're getting ready to head into, all three of which are on the road. So you're going to be looking for a team that's coming off of seven wins in a row, due for a loss at some point, and maybe even due for a clunker of a game. And if they're due, because they've been playing very well lately, if they're due for a clunker of a game, these are GPP spots to attack. Not saying it's going to pan out tonight, not saying it's going to pan out the next two games. But I would be looking actually at Colorado at home coming into St. Louis. That might not be so much of a trap game, but some of these are going to be kind of like trap situations where St. Louis is really, really due for a letdown. GPP narratives will bank on that. Cash games will just keep riding the train. Riding the train until it cuts you off. Toronto, big offense, decent defense to attack by the other team. Uh, Vegas, not scoring a ton, giving up some goals. So Tor Tor Toronto's in a pretty good spot. You know, Vegas could come through with a couple of goals themselves, but Toronto's in a pretty good spot. Vancouver on a back-to-back, -back, no goals for, not, not the kind of defense we're really looking to tear up and attack, but not bad. So LA's in an okay spot. LA's been scoring a little bit lately off of their 2.3 per game season low, season long numbers and low, and giving up some goals against. So this game could go either way. Being a five and a half, I might side with Vegas and kind of focus a little bit more on the Winnipegs and Chicago's, uh, maybe a St. Louis. Washington's been okay. San Jose's been great offensively. Washington's been giving up a ton of goals. So that puts San Jose in an outstanding spot because, once again, you're sitting here with a bright green 4-point whatever over their last 10 going up against a 4.2 or whatever against. That's a good, good, good spot. San Jose to right up there with Winnipeg and Chicago tonight. Giving up some goals against. So Washington's in an okay spot themselves. This game has some shootout potential, hence the 6.5. That pretty much rounds that part out. I'll show you the lineups tab really, really quick because this is a quick way to determine who you might be targeting. Roll through this page, and you can see last 10 games, last 5 games. You can see in the green who's hot and who's not. Look, this top line of Columbus is doing a lot better than this top line of New York in the last five games, last 10 games as well. Lots of green here, lots of red here. That's why we're avoiding New York. But you can see here the line, top line, top defensive pairing, second line, second defensive pairing, and what power play unit they sit on. So what you're looking at here is say that uh, Matthew Barzel is on the second line in the top power play unit. I would take a second line guy and a top line guy and maybe pair them together in a cash game when they both overlap on the same power play unit. 
And that's about as much stacking as I'll do in cash games. And it won't be with New York. It'll be with other teams. But that's kind of the idea what I'm looking for. I'm going to stack different even strength lines overlap on the power play. Now, I can stack the same line, these two both here, Barzil and Bouvier, that are both line two, and then they're on different power plays because at least it breaks them up a little bit. And if they're not on the ice at the same time and a goal gets scored, I might get a piece of it from somebody. Again, a tournament play would be just load up all these top line guys because they're all out there together all game long. And if they score, somebody's probably got the goal and the assists. And that's what you're wanting for tournaments. But it's very boomer bust because if this line does the scoring, puts in two or three goals out of, say, three goals or four, this team got screwed or this line got screwed. That stack blew up on you and this, black, this stack took off on you. Better examples here between line one and line two, but hopefully you see the idea as you thumb through this page. You can see Calgary, good offense, Florida, not bad, but not great. You can see where a lot of the production is coming from. It's always on these top lines for the most part. You know, you might see where's Tampa Bay. Sometimes in Tampa Bay, you can see the second line doing it. They're a fairly deep team, but usually it's these top lines. That's where you want to try and stay as much as you can. Top lines, top defensive pairings. Okay, that's kind of the idea behind it. Here's a second line in Chicago that's really tearing things up. This is how hot Chicago is as a whole. When you see this, you might take the money savings here, take the line two, and then take a top line somewhere else because the other team isn't doing the other part of the team isn't doing anything. So if you're going to get anything, it's going to be out of that top line. But on Chicago, you can probably take either of the two lines, or you could take since these guys overlap on the top power play and these guys are on the top power play as well. You could probably take Dylan Strom, Alex DeBrinket. Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane, stack all four of them together. You've got two line coverage with two skaters each. They all four sit on the power play goal and just hope they score a lot of power play goals. And honestly, that is a method that has been working for two weeks now or so that I've been running full four stacks of Chicago. And I've been running them sometimes in cash games too. Gets into the next kind of little bit. And when we're talking about cash and, and GPP, you heard me say kind of spread out a little bit. You heard me say whatever. I'm going to hear a lot of, is this cash safe or is this hybrid safe or is this GPP? Dudes, it's freaking hockey. It's volatile. You can go for a boomer bust nature in cash games because you really don't have that much weaker of an edge or that much smaller of an edge over the dudes that are spreading out and taking no stacking whatsoever. I'm running a little contest right now. I haven't showed it the past couple of days. Uh, where I'm running a cash lineup and I'm running a GPP, you know, a couple of GPP lineups, and I'm seeing which one scores over. How often does the cash line go over 130, and how often does the GPP line go over 180? And right now the GPP lines are blowing them away. The cash line's always hitting somewhere between 98 and 140, and the GPP lineup is hitting anywhere between 70 something and 210. GPP lines are definitely going to be more volatile. You're going to miss with them worse than you miss with the others. But you know what? If you get a 98 out of your cash lineup, you ain't cashing with it either. So really and truly, if you ladder and play hybrid lineups, just build a GPP type of lineup. Don't go contrarian with it. Don't go banking on, well, New York hadn't been playing very well lately, so I'm going to stack up the New York Islanders and hope that they flip the switch. No, 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 no. That's definitely GPP. But stack Chicago. When you see a team like this, Freaking take them. Yes, if they score only two goals tonight, it's going to hurt you. Not if they were both power play goals and Taves passed to Kane, who passed to Dylan Strom, who scored, and then DeBrinket scored one from Kane and Taves on the power play. What if that's enough? That's plenty enough to get you into cash games, as long as the rest of your lineup did okay too. What you can't be is really a shutout. But if you've got this much of one team, they score a couple, two, three goals, you're going to get enough pieces of them that you should still be okay. So I would just really blur that line between a cash and a GPP lineup in NHL. That's just my experience. It's the way I play. I'm a chalk eater. I'm a conservative guy. I'm a risk-averse guy. And I'm telling you, in baseball and hockey, screw the cash versus GPP thing. It's overrated. You can do fine with both. You're going to hit more uh, lower lows with a GPP stacked lineup than you are a cash lineup, but you're going to hit higher highs with it too. Your cash, your cash lineup is definitely capped because it is not correlated when it comes to NHL and MLB. Just remember that going forward. We're getting ready to roll into the baseball season. This is my favorite page right here. I'm going to turn this X off here by holding the control key, clicking it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll all the way over here to the right. 
And I'm going to go into the FanDuel last five game average. We're going to play a little game I like to call called Buyers and Sellers. This is for you new guys. It runs on the 10 game baseline. These are the fantasy points they've been scoring over 10 games on FanDuel. DraftKings works the same. And these are the last five games. And this is the base, uh, the, the, the five game average, if you will. If the five game average is above the 10 game average, it stands to reason that pricing hasn't probably caught up because pricing trails by a few games. If he's scoring a lot recently and his 10 game average hasn't obviously caught up to his five game average because he's running balls on hot, there's no way his salary is caught up to him yet. He's currently a value play. He's currently a bargain. I don't care what his price tag is. He's currently a bargain. However, if his five game number is below his 10 game number, he's currently overpriced because as we know, prices go up in DFS way faster than they come down. And that's going to happen more often than the other way around. It's harder to find value plays in DFS than it is to find overpriced guys that were hot and then cooled off. Don't be the fish that continues chasing these points on a Sidney Crosby who hasn't produced for two weeks. Don't pay those prices. You're basically buying a Cadillac when you could drive a Chevy. I would rather buy the Pinto and have it run the race of its life. That's just DFS 101. And hopefully you understand exactly what I'm saying when I draw that little bit of an analogy because you're trying to get you're trying to get everything on sale. I'm, I've, I've got $60,000 to deal with. And with that $60,000, I'm trying to get $70,000, $90,000 worth of production. And that's going to beat the other people who only get $60,000 worth of production or $50,000 worth of production because they overpaid for everything. So I'm trying to underpay for everything and hope it continues to produce like it's been producing for the prices that it's that they've been charging me, which are too low. And here's how we find them. We use buyers and sellers. We sort by the FanDuel average. Then we look at a comparison of the FanDuel average of 10 games. And with all of the positions, I already know that that's sorted out. So I can start with the center position. And I can watch the FanDuel salary and look for out-of-place salaries. The sevens and eights are always up top. There's a 6,400. Thomas Hurdle. I don't care he's on the third line. Thomas Hurdle is currently a value play according to these guys. He's getting similar production to these guys, and he's $1,000 less. Value. 5,800 in Dylan Strome, still a value. 6,300, Ryan Johansson, probably a value. 4,200 in Adrian Kempe. I don't care if he's power play two in third line. Dude is, has been producing along with these guys that should be $6,000. He's damn near $2,000 worth of value. His DK salary at 2900 is stupid low. Holy cow, that's stupid. If I was a DraftKings guy, I'm not saying I'd be all in on the guy. I'm saying I would give him a big, long, hard look. And we're not excited about LA tonight. But that is a value saver if I ever saw one. 7100 74 These guys are getting a little overpriced. They should be up here on the list, right? 8000 should definitely be up here on the list. 6800 should be up here on the list. So as I'm scrolling down this looking for cheaper guys again, they need to get a little cheaper as I go, but 5,800 for Deneau is not bad. 3,500 is the wrong Sebastian Ajo. Do not play Sebastian Ajo from the New York Islanders. This is him. Don't play him. Those numbers are not right. 5,200, 5,200, 3,900, Nick Cousins. No power play time. This would worry me a little bit, but third line, Arizona. Arizona's at home. He should get a little bit more ice time. 3,900, not the worst play in the world. Okay, and you could scroll down on a bigger slate and keep going. But look, 7,800, way overpriced, Nathan McKinnon. Sorry. Not saying he's not a great tournament play if you're going to violate this type of value rule and just go straight for trying to hit home runs. He can definitely hit home runs. But in terms of like a cash or a hybrid build or a value-centric build, he's not where I would be looking tonight. Okay, I'd be looking for the guys. I mean, if I was going to pay... 7800 for a Nathan McKinnon, I'd much rather pay 7500 for Jonathan Taves because when I look over here at the 5 and 10 game numbers, Taves, 26 points through five, uh, 10 games, 27 and a half through you know, 5 games, still more or less a buy signal. And McKinnon is only 17 and 13, so way down. He should be up there in the 20s as well. That's why he's a sell right now. We can do the same thing with the defense. You already found a couple of value plays out of there. Defense. 
4,600, 4,600, 4,800, this is all about the same, right? 5,700, probably overpriced compared to these guys, right? So Klingberg, don't need him. 4,500 right up here with these guys. For 4,500, I'd rather take this one, you know, Nate Schmidt for 4,400 if he's playing right now, or Jake Muzzin for 4,600, right? 3,600, now we're talking. There's a little bit of a value in Mike Matheson potentially in Florida. Florida's not a target team tonight, but as a one-off, he's producing. I would look at a shot and block type floor with him. I may show you that in a minute. 4,100, 4,600, uh, Cernak, uh, Vince Dunn, 6,300. Sorry, John Carlson. For 6,300, I would rather be taking these guys up in here. They're producing the same or better than you are. 3,900, uh, Gerard, Ryan Murray, Carl Gunnarsson. I, there's not a lot to like in this cheap, cheap, cheap range right now. I probably would just go double fours and just run these dudes out. So who are we looking at with the shot on block floor? Matheson. So let's scroll over here and take a look at it. For defensemen especially, shots on goal and blocked shots are your floor. You get the same amount of points for a shot versus a block. Defensemen block shots more than forwards do. So this actually tends to add up. These guys, 35, 35, 35, 30, 30, 20 is a little low for Brody. 38, they're almost 40 again. 32 for Matheson's a little low compared to these guys. So he's obviously been producing lately. So I look at his even strength goals of one, his assists of two, a little bit of power play help here, and 15 is lower than half of the 32. So he's actually possibly on the decline in that he has not kept pace with this number. He's just been outproducing this. Goals and assists are a little bit fluky. You can depend more on shots on goal and block shots, so I would actually devalue that 3,900 accordingly. I'd still be stuck on these guys up here. They are producing. They've got high shot on block floors or shot on goal and block floors. A couple of these guys here, Schmidt and Ekblad, definitely have higher shot on goal floors than you know Hiskinen at eight. This is weak. This is a weak sauce number. It's his two assists that are helping him out. His his three assists, his goal, you know, his power play stuff. No shots to speak of. One block, seven shots. That's weak. I'm looking for guys. These are guys that get power play time. These are guys that are flinging the pucks to the net. They get redirections. When the puck gets redirected and goes in the net, it's a, an assist for the defenseman. That's how they pick up some of these assists. I would say Heskin has been running a little bit lucky lately. I'm generally sticking in this as much as I can, looking at these numbers here, and then I'm watching for, you know, like a 13.9 in Ekblad versus a 13.5. That's a very stable defenseman, probably a cash safe defenseman right now in that he's got he's just been producing over 10 games just like he's been producing over five so very steady eddy whereas some of these other guys like this 9.8 here and this 12.9 is running a little bit hot if i saw an even lower number you know 8.7 versus an 11 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. okay so no real dramatic discrepancies where some dude's like a seven and then there's all of a sudden over here at a 13 that'd be crazy hot okay but generally speaking these are the numbers i'm looking at i'm comparing them to these and i'm over here on the left looking for out of place salaries. Once I've sorted by production, what salaries are out of place and jumping up to the top. So let's do the wings really quick and then we'll send you out of here because this is a really long video. But NHL is just hard to cover. It takes time. This is as fast as it gets, I promise you. You can listen to an hour and a half podcast that isn't going to give you this kind of information, much less show you how to find it for yourself. That's the beauty. That's the sweet spot. So again, looking at some of these guys over here and they're Fan duel numbers, that can't be right. These are the that's all we get for the wings. Did we scroll down or something? Ah, we scrolled down. That's what it was. Because these numbers are generally up in the high twenties and the thirties, in some cases forties. To Brink at Kucherov, Evander Kane, Druin, Lindholm, Cahoon. This is a cheap Chicago guy. Tarasenko, Ovechkin, Tofoli, LeBanc. These are the guys that you need to be looking at. These are the guys what say above, say twenty, Forsberg and up, Cam Atkinson and up. Josh Anderson's a great play, too. But these guys in up, let's call it Josh Anderson and up. And let's go comparing the run they're on. Josh Anderson, 5,100. Dirt cheap compared to these guys. 4,700 for Cahoon. Second line in Chicago. He's up there with Debrinkit and Strom. Debrinkit and Strom go play on the power play one. That leaves Cahoon for the two. But it doesn't much matter because he's been producing. That's why the 4,700's up here so, so pretty. Big value play. He might crap on you. Again, these guys don't have floors. They can, any one of them, Ovechkin can get you a zero tonight. 
All of them can. So don't be disappointed and say, ah, oh, you led me the wrong direction. Trust me, I'm leading you the right direction because he's dirt cheap and he's been producing. There's no indication that he's not going to produce, but we need to understand that he can get you a zero in any given night. Okay? So you run him out there, you take the chance. You stack him around a couple of his line mates and hope that somebody picks him up if he doesn't have a great night and somebody else has a pretty good night. Or if somebody else has a good night, he was in on helping it. 7,100, way better than 8,800. I would take to bring it over Kucherov right now, although Kucherov has really spiked up to the top of this list lately. He was down in here before. 7,800, again, a little pricey up towards the top of the list. They're about where they should be. Druin is cheap for 6,300. Lindholm's pretty cheap for 67. We just talked about Cahoon, 8,387. They're okay, starting to get a little pricey. 6,000 is too cheap for Toffoli compared to how he's been producing. 4,200 for LeBanc is way too cheap. You want to run LeBanc and Cahoon as your two value plays, run a couple of mid $4,000 defensemen, and then just, man, I mean, seriously, like the, you know, for ladies out there, the guy who hasn't had sex in three weeks. I mean, you can literally just have your way with the rest of the lineup if you stack all this cheap stuff up and then just go after the big prize. I mean, that's just, pardon my pun with big prize, wishful thinking, right? But the point is, that's how you play DFS. You find a few of these value plays, you lock them in, something that has the odds in its favor to work out for you. And then you stack the rest of its crap around it and hope it all hits. That's just DFS. 4,200 again for LeBanc, 9,000 for Patrick Kane. He's starting to fall down this list. He was way up here before, leading by a mile. He's starting to come down off that list. And as he comes down off that list, he's overpriced. People that are playing Patrick Kane right now in the industry, watch his ownership. People that are playing Patrick Kane right now, he may have a good night tonight, but those that are playing him right now are paying $9,000 for 22 points. Barely 2x. That's not good. When you can pay 7100 for Debrinket and get over 4x. See, there's your value play right there. People are going to play Patrick Kane. He'll carry probably higher ownership than Debrinket. And I'm sorry, but he's not playing as well as Debrinket right now. The people that are playing Patrick Kane are lazy. They're just saying he's been great lately, and they run him out there. They're not actually looking at numbers. So, therefore, the people playing Patrick Kane right now are your edge. Those lazy people that aren't doing it is some form of a – it's not even a contrarian stack. It's just, honestly, an overpriced play. Over the next three to five games, it's going to hurt you more than it's going to help you. He is a great player. Don't get me wrong. He's been on a tear lately. Don't get me wrong. But it's unsustainable, and we are seeing the signs that it is cooling off. Get off the train. Those that are not off the train are late to react. They're lazy. They're your fish. They're your edge. They're not the ones that you are should be worried about when you see them in your head to heads and you see them and you can look at them and you can condescendingly laugh at them right now to bring it is the play let's go back over here and start looking a little bit more now again he probably scored 50 points tonight and make me look like an idiot but track him for the next week track him for the next week and i promise you he's going to hurt you more and he's going to help you at that price now if he was seven thousand we'd reevaluate speaking of seven thousand mark stone this is fairly cheap. 5700 is fairly cheap for Galleon Check. There's an Arizona guy. I told you there's some one off value in Arizona. 6700 is getting it at 7000s or a little bit. I, I would want to see them up in here. Uh, Forsberg, Atkinson, Pavelski. I would want to really see them a little higher on the list. 5100 for Josh Anderson's great value. Down here in the sevens still can pass. Kapanen, 4700. Tyler Bertuzzi, 4300. 3900 for Brett Connolly, even in Washington. Outstanding value plays down here. 8,100 for Johnny Godreau. Patrick, he's worse than Patrick Kane. Right now, that's a major overspend. Now, you want to run a GPP narrative and say, I'm stacking Calgary come hell or high water. That's different. If that pans out, good on you. It can win you a GPP. That's great. If you want to do that with Chicago, fine. You're not going to hear me complain. I'm talking about the guys that are just blindly rostering these guys because they're big names and they've been playing well lately and they're going to pay these premium prices for these guys and they aren't going to look at how they're starting to come down off of their highs. They're starting to lose their buzz. They're hungry pot smokers right now. That's what they are. 
So we scroll down a little bit more, 5,500, 4,600, Eberly. Okay. Again, I told you nothing about New York Islanders was special tonight. But if you wanted to run, I guess Verano is the number I was looking at. But 5,500, I'd rather pay a little less. 4,600 for Verano. Washington's in a little bit better spot. So there you go. 4,100, Zach Hyman. This is a fabulous little play here. A little sneaky one too. It's not as high up the list as some of the others, but at 4100 doesn't cost you much. It gets you access to Vegas, which we said Toronto was in an okay spot tonight. He's on the top line. He doesn't serve any power play time, so people don't like him. That's why he's still cheap, but he's been producing. Vanek. People don't like Detroit, but on the second line, if Vanek was on the road, I would really like him, and I'll explain that another day. But first power play unit, second line, if they were on the road at 4,300, I'd love Vanek as a one-off type of play. I'm not stacking Detroit. But as a little one-off, I'd slip him in there. He'd be my Mickey. I'd slip my lineup of Mickey, right? All right, I think you get the point. I think you've you got the foundation. You understand what we're doing, where we're trying to go, the basics of the research station. It can show you everything you need to know in what's it's been 35 minutes it can show you that in 20 minutes if you're not talking to yourself like i do when i walk through this thing write these things down target your stacks based on the game matchup page come in here look for who's producing on those teams correlate for tournaments maybe only modestly correlate for your cash type scenarios and go run that crap out there take your shot what i like doing is taking three or four different shots i mentioned what winnipeg chicago st louis um, who else did I mention tonight? San Jose, whatever. Let's say I wanted to run a San Jose, Washington stack. Fine. San Jose, St. Louis stack. Fine. Washington, St. Louis stack. Fine. Chicago, St. Louis stack. Fine. I, I'd recommend, I'd recommend against that. There's such heated rivals that Chicago and St. Louis in the same lineup tonight might just implode on you because those two teams just hate each other. Insert joke here. But if you wanted to run San Jose and Chicago or Winnipeg and Chicago or whatever, you need multiple lineups to pull that stuff off. Some of it is going to hit. I don't know which. I know those are the teams that are in great spots. And I'm sure some random team somewhere is going to go off as well that we don't predict or we don't see coming. Happens every night. Get lucky and it be Arizona. Get lucky and it be, um, you know, the Islanders or whatever, then, okay, maybe you got something. I would stick with the little bit chalkier scenarios, and I would try to play the teams that are producing in there. On a big slate like this, I don't worry that much about ownership. I don't really worry about stacking against the chalk on huge slates because really and truly it doesn't provide you the leverage that it does on smaller slates. I would stay sort of within the realm of possibilities, and I would be focused on maybe taking some one-offs from some other situations or maybe, you know, not playing the high, high, obvious spots like the Chicago's or the Winnipeg's tonight. I might slip down and play the San Jose's. I guess they're pretty obvious, too. Maybe the Calgary's, maybe the St. Louis's, whatever. Somebody else that could go off. And then it kind of saved the rest for the real G deep GPP type stuff. It's basically a slate rundown. You've got your stats. You've got your hot buyers versus sellers. You've got your games. You've got everything that you need. A little bit of fundamental talk, hopefully, to get you rocking and rolling for this NHL slate as you come off of NBA All-Star Weekend. If you like this type of video, like and subscribe down below. Comment, I'll probably comment back. Ring the notification bell, you'll get notifications on your phone for every video that I drop. And I've been dropping a lot of them lately because I've been getting a lot of great response. Use the coupon code if you're not a member at DFS Army down low in the comment section, coupon code CHOP, C-H-O-P, to trigger 20% off of your subscription price and get your butt in here and start winning today. The link is in there right there. Just click the link, use the code, in you go. Thanks everybody for the support with Mark Sweeps and stuff out on Twitter. I'll talk more about that another time next week. I'm going to probably flip the weather channel on and see what's going on out there in California uh, with all of the golf stuff. And we'll talk a little bit more inside the coaching channels about building uh, hockey lineups tonight. So take care guys and we will uh, see you later this weekend.